Well, good morning and welcome to the uh, 28th meeting of the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee. I would ask everyone present to turn electrical devices to silence so as not to interfere with proceedings. Um, I have apologies from Gil Patterson, committee member, and uh, I would like to welcome Alec Neal, who is here as a substitute for Gordon MacDonald and will be with us for the next few sessions. So I would invite Alec Neal to make a declaration of any relevant interests. Chair, my register of interest, the convener, I, I'm a part-time advisor to Ethics Energy Limited, and I'm also a co-convener of the cross-party group on Brexit in the Scottish Parliament. Thank you very much. Uh, decision item two, sorry, item two is a decision by the committee to take items four and five in private. Are we agreed on that? Yes. Thank you. Now, we turn to our economic data inquiry, and uh, I would like to welcome our witnesses today. We have today Sir Charles Bean, budge of, a member of the Budget Responsibility Committee, I think, in the Office for Budget Responsibility. Ed Humpherson, who is Director General for Regulation of the UK Statistics Authority, and Jonathan Atho, who is Deputy National Statistician and Director General for Economic Statistics in the Office for National Statistics. So welcome to all three of you this morning. And if I might start with a fairly general question, and that is what do you think of the current provision of economic statistics in Scotland? what you might view as gaps in the coverage in those statistics and what specific recommendations you would have for improving. And uh, as we go through the questions, uh, please don't feel you have to answer each and every question, but um, do come in and indicate if you want to come in by simply raising your hand. So I don't know who would like to kick off with that particular question from myself or questions from myself. Um, well, I'm, I'm actually going to throw the ball to Jonathan on this <laughs> for, for, well. for quite a good reason, because um, uh, in my review, which uh, came out uh, um, well over a year ago now, uh, it flagged that one of the areas where uh, more work was needed was regional statistics in general, but it recognised the problems uh, of uh, doing that. Uh, and in particular, if you want lots of detailed regional statistics, you obviously need lots of information. And the finer the degree of disaggregation that you want to look at, the more information you have to collect. So I had basically seen that really the only way of unlocking this uh, was access to administrative data, which, of course, the Digital Economy Bill has facilitated. Uh, but I do know that the Office for National Statistics has actually been moving forward in plugging some of the gaps uh, that I had flagged in my review. So it's probably better for Jonathan to talk about the work that they're actually doing at the moment uh, and things that they have planned in terms of the uh, regional statistical estate, and obviously particularly uh, ap apropos Scotland. So... I might start by sort of just saying, actually, we're on a, quite a journey here. Um, I think the way in which devolution is changing in Scotland has changed needs and uh, user needs of, sort of where we start from in terms of thinking about, about our statistics. And following um, Sir Charles's review, we have now put an added impetus onto making certain uh, there is additional uh, geographical detail available. Um, and that obviously applies to Scotland, but also applies to Wales, uh, Northern Ireland and, and the English regions as, as well. So it, it is something where we are changing, where we've got an, a, a few things we have done differently recently. Uh, so we published uh, public finance statistics uh, for all uh, the uh, countries and regions of, of, the, of the UK, uh, building actually on some work done in, in, in the Scottish Government through JERS. Um, so things can be done, things are, are moving. Uh, next month we pan, plan to publish something called uh, a balanced measure of gross value added. So gross value added is very is, is akin to uh, GDP. Uh, previously we have published these uh, statistics for, for, for Scotland but um, there's actually been two different measures um, uh, using the, in, uh, the income and the production uh, approach. We're actually going to produce a single measure to give 
users in Scotland a much clearer picture of economic activity uh, in, in Scotland. So there are, there are lots of plans in place to improve statistics, but really that comes from user need. Um, and that will come from what uh, the Scottish Government uh, wants. It will also come from what other um, users in Scotland uh, are, are looking for. So we are thinking quite widely uh, ab 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 about this. We are publishing, uh, I think, uh, Thursday this week, we're publishing a, uh, a study looking at whether, how, how practical it would be to publish a different inflation uh, estimate of inflation for uh, the countries and regions of, 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 of the, the UK. That's always been something we've thought has been quite difficult um, because of the way prices are collected uh, to inform inflation statistics, but that's exactly something we're looking forward to think about whether we can uh, provide that sort of information because that's been a gap that there has been, been in the past. So. I think the answer here is we want to be as responsive as we can be to user needs. There are real challenges, um, as Sir Charles said. In some cases, um, the, the way samples are collected uh, for statistical purposes, the, the surveys that are collected, means it's very difficult to go to very fine levels of, of geography. Um, and often people want not just Scotland, but uh, you know particular geographies within within Scotland. Obviously, there are city deals now emerging in in Scotland, so people want to understand what's going on in their local area. But that's always going to be very difficult when you're collecting data from surveys. So um, uh, one of the things we are now trying to do is unlock the potential of uh, administrative data. So one of our first data sets is to use VAT data uh, from uh, HM Revenue and Customs. That allows us to understand what's going on with economic activity uh, in a particular area. That should allow us to have a better understanding of what, what, what's going on. Um, we, we've, we're only starting to explore that, uh, but actually it's that data that underpins our balanced gross value added statistics that I talked about earlier. So this is an evolving area. Um, there, are some, there have been some gaps, but we're trying to fill them. But as I said, coming back to what I was saying at the beginning, really we are guided by user need. And actually if this committee comes out with particular areas or particular gaps that it's heard from, from users, that will be very useful to us in informing our work programme and our conversations with the Scottish Government about how we work together to make certain there are good uh, economic statistics for Scotland. Thank you. Um, my perspective is of the person who uh, heads up the Office for Statistics Regulation. And as such, what we do is we oversee statistics produced in any part of the United Kingdom, certainly produced by Jonathan and his teams in ONS, uh, but also the Scottish Government, Whitehall Departments, the Welsh Government, Government, the Northern Ireland Administration. And that gives us a really good capacity, I think, to look across uh, the whole provision of statistics in the round and, and, and form, a, form an overview. And I think from that perspective, I'd say that Scottish uh, economic uh, statistics produced by the Scottish Government were in a good place um, in two senses. Firstly, uh, it seems to me that there is a very clear framework um, for the development of the statistics and the production of the statistics, starting with national accounts, um, with some good sectoral information on different sectors of the, the, the Scottish economy um, and with some good labour market information as well. Um, so I think there's a clear framework. One of the things about a clear framework is that it really helps you much more clearly see where the gaps are. It's harder to see where the gaps are if you get a, a kind of a fairly random collection of data releases. With a clear uh, framework, you can see where something is stronger and weaker. And there are some weaknesses. There are clearly some weaknesses. Um, which brings me on to my second um, uh, point uh, about why I think the Scottish Government is in a relatively good place, which is there is um, both an appetite for improvement, for addressing uh, the gaps, and also a track record of having done so. And I think you heard a lot from your witnesses in previous sessions about the improvements that have been made over time to um, Scottish uh, economic statistics. Those gaps are significant. Um, Jonathan has mentioned prices. Um, uh, th those, those, those data and, until recently haven't been available uh, in, in Scotland. Um, there's um, questions about trade information, exports and particularly imports. Uh, and there's, of course, also questions about um, the timeliness of regional um, economic statistics. I think that one um, 
set of evidence that you received really stood out for me, though, which was the Scottish Fiscal Commission talking about uh, labour market information, um, income and earnings, and how um, more timely and more comprehensive information on income and earnings would really help them uh, forecasting the economy and forecasting income tax receipts. And that strikes me as being a really very salient issue that would be very sensible um, for the Scottish Government in, in um, partnership with ONS to, to address. So we see a, a good base, uh, but clearly some uh, an appetite for improvement and some things really do need to improve. Thank you. And John Mason. Uh, thanks, Convener. And uh, I mean, that, I think you touched on a lot of issues between you there that I think we're, we're going to try and explore a little bit further. Um, I mean, the Digital Economy Act has been mentioned and the fact, I think Mr. Atho especially, that we're moving towards a bit more administrative data rather than surveys. I mean, how, how do you see the kind of UK picture at the moment? I mean, is that is that a kind of the Digital Economy Act, is that going to fix everything or are there other things we're needing to move on? And how does the UK compare, would you say, to other countries? Because we hear a lot of good stuff, but it tends to be often about small countries like Estonia and Denmark and the Netherlands. Um, and maybe that's just not possible at a UK level. So I'm interested to see where you all see that the kind of UK is going on this. Well, if, if I could just start on that. Uh, it's not just small countries that have made uh, effective use of administrative data. So Canada, who are regarded as one of the best uh, national statistical institutes, they rely very heavily uh, on administrative data. And basically... Uh, whenever uh, they want to run a new survey or something, they have to make the case that they can't get the information from existing data sources. Um, and it's very notable that the uh, Canadian Statistical Authority uh, is a, a much more innovative, agile uh, institution uh, as a result. Um, you know, it's regarded as one of the, the best employers in Canada, it's one of the best places for economists to work, uh, things like that. Um, so I don't think you should think of administrative um, data as being a, just a preserve of, of uh, small countries. And I think there's a lot of potential there. But equally, it's not going to solve everything. Uh, and the key thing, of course, about, about administrative data and private sector big data uh, as well is that the information is not generally collected with statistical use uh, in mind. It's uh, collected as a byproduct of collecting taxes, or uh, if it's in the private sector, uh, supermarkets um, pricing their products and registering what's being sold and so forth. Uh, and then uh, it's a question of statisticians levering off that. So that you need to use judgment and expertise in the way that information uh, is exploited and it needs to be used often with surveys where you need surveys to uh, to fill gaps and so forth. So uh, I certainly took the view in my review that while unlocking administrative data was certainly helpful uh, and an important step forward, it's not a silver bullet uh, that's going to, to solve all the, the UK or Scotland's uh, statistical problems. Uh, just as far as the Act itself goes, I should say it actually has ended up going further uh, than I uh, thought was, uh, was possible. Uh, I mean, I, in my review, I focused particularly on um, facilitating ONS access to uh, administrative data held elsewhere in government, most obviously the tax authorities. But it's not solely the tax authorities, because obviously lots of other departments have similar information that may be, uh, may be potentially uh, of use. Um, and I didn't really wade too much into the uh, access to private sector uh, data question. Uh, in fact, the, the Act, as implemented, gives the ONS rather more uh, scope uh, for using private sector uh, data than I anticipate. But most importantly, because this is the first step, uh, it removes the obstacles that were there to effective use uh, of administrative data um, uh, across Whitehall ministries uh, and so forth. There need to be protocols put in place, which I think the ONS are presently consulting on, uh, but I'm pretty happy personally with where the digital economy 
uh, Act came out. I mean, Jonathan may want to expand on some details of how he anticipates it's operating, but I think we're in a, a much better place now uh, than we were. Um, so are we comparable? I mean, we're maybe not comparable with Canada, but would you say we're kind of comparable with Germany, the States, Japan? Well, I, I think potentially we could be comparable with Canada, mm -hmm. uh, yes. Okay. Uh, that's, that's what we should be aspiring to, not, not just comparable to overtaking them. I think um, underpinning y y your question were, was, you know, were we were we keeping up with uh, leading practice? And I think on administrative data, we, we, we weren't in the first group of countries who were using uh, administrative data. Um, uh, but now we have the Digital Economy uh, Act, and we were able to learn, I think, from how other countries had uh, uh, done it. Um, other countries had focused, for example, pri f primarily on government-held data. We could think, actually, there is advantage in also having powers over private sector data. Um, yeah, some of you may have seen, it was reported in some of the newspapers this morning, we've been looking at mobile phone data to understand commuting patterns, um, uh, how people, you know, where they travel to work from. Um, so we know mobile phone data could be a very rich source of, uh, of, of understanding of what's going on in the economy as well. So we know the, the, the private sector is also, is also very important. Um, we've also been able to learn from other countries that, have, that have, have, have gone first in terms of the techniques they've used. Um, so from December this year, we'll be using VAT data to put together our national accounts, to put together our measures of GDP. Um, we've worked very closely with the Dutch statistical uh, office because that they, that they've done that for a number of years. We were able to learn how they used it um, because um, one of the, the points Sir Charles makes that I think is very relevant is this data isn't primarily for statistical purposes and you need to invest time in understanding it. Um, you might have to use different methods, different, um, uh, different statistical techniques to understand it. You might find it fits some parts of the economy very well. So we found some areas, some sectors of the economy where the VAT data describes what's going on very well and other areas where it doesn't. And that's sometimes understanding the way it's collected. So VAT data, for some companies, they will send in one return covering a, num a large number of businesses. So it's sometimes difficult to apportion how much economic activity is happening in a particular, uh, a particular company or a particular local uh, local organisational unit. Just specifically on that point, I mean, also they wouldn't be splitting it between Scotland and Wales and no, the no, it, 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 these kind of things. Exactly. So you have to understand the nature of how that data is uh, su submitted, whether you want to apportion it, um, or whether actually that's an area where you still want to use a survey. It may be for some of those very complex companies, you may want to ask them a survey because actually it's it's better than the better than the data, uh, sorry, better than the administrative data. So, so, so can I, if I can just press you on that particular yeah. point, I mean, like, so the Scottish government doesn't have access to, largely, to VAT returns and, and so on, and even if they did, it would be possibly at a UK level. So is there something we can learn? Is there something we can take forward? Should we look to you to kind of get a bit more detail, or should we be doing something ourselves? Well, I, I think it, we want to use uh, that, that data to understand so industry breakdown and geographical break, breakdown. And for some companies, that will work very well. Because um, some companies, you know, if you are, all your activity is based within a particular, particular area, you know, the VAT data will work very, very well, well, well for that. So it's just about understanding where it works and where it, where it doesn't. Um, that's something where, you know, we will want to talk to the Scottish government to understand what, their, what, what the Scottish government data needs are. And then we can work through how do we how do we meet those needs? Is it administrative data? Is it survey data? Is it a blend, uh, blend of the two? And how, how do we go about doing that? Um, and one of the things we want to start doing as we go, go, go forward is also then making the underlying data available. So one of the, I think, revolutions in, in statistics, uh, probably in the last 10 or 20 years, is that more of the underlying data is now made available for, um, uh, for anybody um, whether that's an academic researcher or a government researcher, to access. So um, ONS data, although that's mainly survey data at, at the moment, is available uh, to researchers to interrogate. Um, um, and uh, you know, we would want to make certain as we get these rich data sources, those, those data sources are also available 
uh, for people to then do their own analysis um, because we can't cover every particular uh, cut of the data that people pe people want. So we do want to make that data data available for people to to meet uh, to, to be able to do their own analysis. But we also want to work very closely with uh, Scottish government and other users in Scotland to understand what their needs are. Okay. And Richard Leonard. Uh, thanks, Convener. Um, we've received quite a lot of evidence, both oral and written, uh, about the poor response rate to uh, key surveys that are issued by the Scottish Government. And so there's a global connection survey which looks at export data especially, uh, where the, uh, the response rate is, is, is pretty low. So um, I, I suppose one of the things that we're examining is, is what can be done about this uh, and is the solution uh, to uh, uh, give to the Scottish Government the kind of powers that ONS has got, for example, or the Northern Ireland Statistical Agency has got to compel businesses, for example, to respond to surveys? And I wonder whether you've got a view on that. Shall I, shall I start on, on that? I mean, with, with business surveys, we have a, uh, um, under the Statistics and Registration Services Act, we have the power to compel businesses. And in general, um, response rates from businesses are, given, given, that, given that basis, quite, quite, quite strong. Um, we obviously, in some cases, uh, um, uh, some of our surveys have a particular Scottish, what we call a boost to the sa sample, and of course we can use our powers there to make certain that that, that boost that the Scottish Government uh, wants is collected uh, effectively. So within the business surveys, I, I don't see there is a particular, uh, a particular issue. Now, <coughs> the issue for bi businesses is one of burden. Um, we know that um, businesses would rather be getting on running their own business rather than filling in in forms for us but that's where for example using administrative data could be very very helpful that we can reduce the burdens there i think for individuals there is a real challenge uh, about about res res response rates um we know fewer and fewer people pick up their landline telephones and when they do often you know we, we all know uh, whether it's somebody trying to uh, talk to us about ppi or trying to sell us some something else there is a <coughs> A, a large deg degree of scepticism um, when we are trying to collect data uh, o o over the phone or even sometimes fa face, face to face. So with individuals, it is very, it's a challenging environment and we're seeing our uh, re response rates for our individuals' uh, surveys falling. Uh, and that is a concern um, because it, that, that falling response rates could lead to some biases in the uh, in, in the surveys if you're not very very careful at understanding what, what what's going on so that is a particular particular challenge uh, we're fin finding that in particular on our labor force survey which obviously underpins a lot of our uh, well pretty much all of our employment uh, uh, employment statistics that fewer and fewer people are, are willing to participate in that what we are trying to do is, is get under the surface of that are the ways we can shorten the forms, shorten the questions we ask, because sometimes it's the, the fact you have to be on the phone for 30 minutes or so might put people off. Um, are there behavioural insights we can uh, use, nudge techniques we can, we can use? Um, are there ways we could provide incentives for people to, to, to respond? So we are trying a mix of those, those, those different, different things. But it is a challenging environment, and I think many countries around the world are finding people are less willing uh, to uh, to part participate. Um, again, that's something where can we use um, administrative data to take some of the questions out? So, you know, we will ask people what their income is, but actually, um, if you're an employee uh, through the PAYE system, you will uh, you, that, that information should should be available. So, are there ways we can use administrative data, data there to reduce the burdens and prop up uh, response rates? But it is a real challenge around individuals, as I said, businesses less concerned there, more concerned about burdens on them. On the um, specific point about Global Connection Survey, I, I won't uh, give a view on the general power to compel, but I think if you look at the Global Connection Survey, you're, you're, you're right that the response rate is um, relatively low. I think it's something like 1,700 responses out of 5,500 surveys sent out, something of that order. Um, I think the question is, would you want to compel if you had the power. And the question there is um, balancing the, the, the cost, which would be the, the burden, 
uh, the respondent burden with the benefit. And the benefit, you'd have to think about, well, how much more information would you get from a more complete survey? And there are, um, there are statistical approaches to saying, well, what's going on with the non-respondents? What's the non-response, what's called the non-response bias? Um, it may well be that 1500 is giving you a sufficiently reliable picture um, because there's no difference between the respondents and the non-respondents. It could also be that the non-respondents have a very different structure or different ownership, um, and therefore you're missing quite a lot of information from those missing responses. I think that's the way to think about it, is what would you get from a greater response rate, and does that merit the, uh, the costs of, of, of compulsion where you have the power to compel? So one other thing that might be worth injecting into this, which connects a little bit with Jonathan's comment about sort of nudge techniques, is if you can give an, in an incentive to the person you're surveying uh, to uh, complete the survey or provide the information uh, so that he, he or she get something in return from doing that, whether that's financial or there's something about what the survey is used for, that that information can be uh, uh, provided back to them, which helps them in their business or whatever. Th that's another way in to do it. Uh, at the moment, uh, very often surveys, it's all burden on the, uh, the person filling in the, uh, the form and their time and so forth. But if they're getting something in return, uh, then they may be more likely to participate. Um. I mean, the, uh, it seems to me, and maybe this is just me being a bit too uh, naive and altruistic, but it seems to me that the, in order to inform public policy, uh, knowing what trade patterns are and where there are gaps and where there could be boosts, uh, could benefit those individual enterprises. Um, um, so, you know, I, that it seems to me to be an area uh, worth exploring. The other thing I'd, that uh, crossed my mind uh, on my less altruistic uh, side of my brain was, uh, what remedies do you have if people do not cooperate? Uh, I don't know the, uh, the the powers, but we certainly have the power to fine um, uh, fine businesses uh, you know, uh, if 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 they, if they if they if they don't comply. That's obviously something we don't want to do. Um, um, and uh, just coming back to your, your, your point, I very much ag uh, agree. And I think there is a, a challenge sometimes as, as a statistical um, uh, office, you will talk about, well, this is very important for the point, point of view of the survey, but then actually you need to tell the picture, the wider picture as to why these surveys are very important. And we find that also is very true um, on the individual survey side. We explain to people why uh, if, you, if we're coming around to understand about your wealth assets, your pension savings, about how that informs government uh, pensions policy. So um, our best field researchers are the ones who make those connections and, ex and explain, ex explain why, because as you, I couldn't agree more that you know, the, these data feed into very important decisions um, and decisions that affect uh, businesses, individuals uh, in, in Scotland, um, and you know, it's um, it, it, it's in some ways a, a public benefit uh, that they, they are through the statistics they help to provide. Okay. Uh, thank you, Bailey. Thank you. Um, we've heard from witnesses that statistics on non-market activities and well-being um, aren't as well covered. Um, and I was wondering, is that just because there's a lack of demand for them? Because the OECD certainly talked about other countries using time use surveys. And I wonder whether the ONS is considering anything similar. So um, maybe I should start by saying we certainly see there is a wider need to go, well, we, well, the, the, fr the phrase we use is sort of beyond GDP. Now, obviously, GDP is very useful. It informs uh, a lot of forecasting around uh, around the economy, around tax collection, um, um, and uh, revenue generation more more widely. So it's really very very important as a as a concept. But we have used time use surveys to look at non market production. Um, we published some results on uh, that uh, l l last year. Um, again, that does show some interesting trends. Uh, actually, non-market non production has grown slightly quicker than GDP in, in, in the, re in the recent, recent past. Um, so that is, that is out there. It's something we'd like to think about how we can make it more sophisticated. But actually, it is quite, that is quite burdensome. When you're asking individuals for how did you spend your time today, <laughs> you can see quite quickly that that becomes quite, uh, quite, quite burdensome. But it, is, it does give you insight into what's happening with patterns of childcare, um, or caring for 
uh, the elderly, how much volunteering go, go, goes on and how much that's worth. So there is quite a lot uh, in, 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 that, in that space. We've published our wellbeing statistics. I think we published uh, the, the next batch, I think, came out this morning. Um, so, you know, that's something where we are trying to make certain we are providing a wider picture. Um, an area actually where the UK leads is on environmental accounts, uh, understanding systematically um, the sort of the, bene the benefits that accrue uh, from biodiversity, from different sorts of uh, different sorts of environmental amenity. Um, so these are areas we are trying to pursue because they are very important to people's quality of quality of life, and people want to know what what is happening with, uh, for example, our forests or or peatland or, or things like things like that. So these are areas we are trying to do to do more. As I said, historically, they've not been. Um, I, I think GDP, uh, because it is so well uh, developed, because it is so well resourced, is in some ways decades ahead in terms of development. But actually, that does mean these other um, interesting areas can catch up quite quickly. Um, and we try to make certain we, we cover them. We obviously have a limited amount of resource and have to balance that, that, that quite carefully. But the, the issues you raise are exactly ones that are very much prominent in our, in, in, in our, in our thinking. I think it's important to distinguish two separate strands in your question. Uh, one is non-market activity, and the other is sort of the broader question of well-being and um, those other indicators. Uh, on the first of those, and one of the issues that um, I discussed in my review uh, was the fact that there might be uh, shifts across the production boundary taking place. I mean, conventionally, statisticians have said, OK, we'll measure what takes place in the market economy uh, and not the stuff that takes place in the non-market economy. There's a lot of economic activity, uh, work that's done at home, charitable activities, uh, and so forth, with some exceptions. So imputed rent of owner-occupiers is a classic example of something which is uh, not within the conventional production boundary, but we measure in the national accounts. And the reason for that is that you don't want to distort the conventional market measures if there's a shift between owner-occupier and rented accommodation. So uh, activities which are sufficiently big and might change in importance, uh, statisticians would think, oh, there's a case for, uh, for measuring them. Uh, at the current juncture, I think it's quite plausible to say that there's quite a lot of activities that previously would have been done by intermediaries in the market economy. I always give the example of travel agents. In the old days, you'd go down when you want to book a holiday, spend an hour talking with the travel agent about where to go, then he'd get on the phone and book the flights for you, book the hotel, you'd go and buy a guidebook. What do you do these days? You do the research online, you book direct with the carrier, uh, maybe stay at Airbnb rather than a conventional hotel, you use Google Maps to get around. A lot of that activity has been taken out of the conventional market economy. So uh, potentially the market economy statistics like GDP uh, are being distorted. Uh, so the solution is not necessarily to say, well, we have to expand the measure to include all these other things, because they may be difficult to measure continuously but as a minimum, you want to know how big the distortions might be, which is where these time use surveys uh, uh, might come in. Uh, and I suspect that uh, we will need to do more of that going forward, but there may be clever ways of getting information on that. So obviously, internet usage uh, is something which we, there is a, a lot of data on collected by the, um, uh, the digital companies. Uh, the broader issue of sort of well-being, of which there's uh, uh, been a lot of interest recently, I should say from my perspective, uh, talking as a, uh, just as a, an academic economist, um, I'm, I'm sceptical of single measures of well-being, gross national happiness, things like that. Uh, I certainly don't think that GDP is a sufficient statistic for welfare or anything like that, and the economists will always tell you that. But I don't think the solution is to get a load of indicators together, throw them in the pot, uh, put some arbitrary weighting system in and say, here's my better measure. Um, GDP 
works uh, as a concept because it, you, it can use prices to weight uh, things together, and prices are a measure of uh, marginal utility. As soon as you start incorporating other things, it's not clear what the weighting should be. So I think a more fruitful way forward is something like a scorecard approach, uh, where you, you decide what indicators you feel you need to look at. And instead of trying to add them all up, you know, you have your 20 or so indicators that you might want to look at. And you look at the detail and discuss which ones you as a policymaker uh, think are the most important. I, I um, very much agree with what Sir Charles has, has said there about this distinction between uh, GDP as this, in, in effect, internationally comparable and consistent measure, um, and then something which might be more um, of a dashboard or a series of indicators that um, responds to um, different policy imperatives and policy drivers. And I think one of the really interesting things that you as a committee have been hearing from your, 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 your witnesses has been this kind of fault line between... Um, what needs to be done to replicate at the Scotland level um, the best possible range of economic statistics that are available um, uh, at the UK level? And that's what lies behind a lot of the gaps that I mentioned in my introduction is sort of that replication. That's important. It's, it's um, uh, uh, very useful um, and, and very much needed. But the fault line is, is between that and then thinking, well, what are the things that we actually care about in the context of Scotland, as, as policymakers, as, as, as people who um, scrutinise government performance. And there, I think, you're not so much in a space of replication, you're in the space of innovation, of thinking, uh, what are the things that, that, that really matter? Um, you, you've talked a lot about the four eyes. I think they are a particular emphasis in um, Scotland's economic strategy. And I think developing a way of getting a really good handle on those is something which could be quite, um, quite innovative. One other thing that I would mention Jonathan talked about uh, personal well-being measures which were published this morning by ONS. I think they're relatively underappreciated as a resource in this space, actually. Um, they're often um, spoken about slightly dismissively as being a, a kind of a, a happiness measure. Um, I think that they now is a growing time series of personal well-being over time. Um, it's quite um, possible to drill down to quite local levels um, because the data set is large enough, and it's quite possible to correlate um, the personal well-being responses that people give with other aspects of their life. I think that's quite a rich policy area to think about well-being, which, is, which has tended to be sort of slightly marginalised. So I'd, I'd encourage some creative thought there as well. OK, I'm curious to know if we're happier or not as a result of the, the survey data. Um, just one supplementary question, because obviously you're starting to collect that wealth of detail. Um, what's the size of the Scottish sample? And would you advise us to collect those ourselves or boost the sample? Um, I, I, I don't know off the top of my head, but I know it's a representative enough sample for, 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 for Scotland, but I can come back to you with the, the exact, uh, exact number. And, and t the way we tend to do it is by tagging some of these questions onto existing surveys. Okay. Um, so often there are a small number of questions, and they will just be, you know, you'll, we will have gone out to talk to somebody about, the, you know, their late, you know, if they're working and, you know, their job, those sorts of things, or you know, their, 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 their pensions or something like that, and then we will tag on the question at the end. So it's often quite easy for us to just add a couple of questions to the end of a, end of a survey. It doesn't really add much to respond to the <laughs> burden, but gives us this much richer source of data. And, and then, of course, you get the, the whole person perspective, because you can relate how an answer on a personal well-being question uh, relates to what they have said in other parts of the survey about their employment status or their pension status or their health or, or whatever it might be. That's why it's quite powerful. For example, one of the um, one of the uh, bits of analysis that has been done has been looking at how uh, how happiness varies according to people's uh, sexual identity uh, and, and issues issues there. So this does give you a very rich data set that goes much beyond economic statistics to understand wider uh, so social uh, phenomena. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, a follow up from Alec Neal before we move to a question from Ash Denham. Okay, thank you, convener. Can I just go back to what you said about the VAT receipts? Uh, because clearly the Scottish fiscal framework agreement between the UK government and the Scottish government has a notional uh, figure in there for VAT receipts. Um, and uh, from what you said, it sounds as though the calculation of VAT receipts allocated to Scotland may not be a reliable figure. Um, 
I think you, you have to, uh, the key thing is to understand there's a distinction between how VAT is collected, it's collected from companies, yeah. but the incidence is borne by individuals. So you may for, uh, and I, um, I don't know exactly how the methodology works, but you might, if you're interested in where the receipts are generated from, you're more interested in where people are spending rather than which company collected it. Yeah. So, um, so you, you, can do you can develop a methodology uh, to, to look at that. It's just, again, you're answering a different question. And it, it just goes back to the point, actually, understand what the how the data is collected and whether the VAT collection data probably doesn't help you understand where the burden of that VAT is paid from. So what's the methodology used then for calculating the Treasury's calculation of VAT allocated to Scotland? I really, I, I don't know off the top of my head how could, that would... Could you come back to us? Yeah, we, we could come back to us, but I'm certain the Scottish Government would have been also involved in, 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 in that work as well. So. Yeah, but the problem is the Scottish yeah. Government doesn't have any of its own yeah. statistics. They, you know, they rely entirely on the yeah. UK... Uh, HMRC and the like to, to provide the statistics. The, the other reason why this is important, there's a political controversy at the moment about VAT on police and fire services. Mm -hmm. And it'd be interesting to know if the methodology uh, can state or not state explicitly if the VAT receipts from the police and fire brigade are actually included in the notional figure for VAT. Because clearly if they are already included, then the situation would be neutral. Uh, if they're not included, then obviously there's a deficit. So that that would be useful if you're able to, to answer that yeah. question as well. Can I can I also go on to, obviously you referred to JERS, and obviously there's been a lot of very good work done mm. north and south of the border on JERS down the years. Uh, the original version, I think, was published when Roy Jenkins was mm. the Chancellor of the Exchequer way back in the late 60s. Um, but uh, as well as that, I mean, clearly there are big big numbers in there for corporation tax and capital gains tax, for example. Um, how reliable are they? So um, there is, um, often when you're getting into apportionment, you need to make some uh, s s some assumptions. Um, uh, and for corporation tax, we do know, for example, from uh, other sources where the how the workforce is distri distributed uh, across Scotland and other parts of other parts of the UK. So sometimes you will use employment as a proxy for where the economic activity is ta ta taking taking place. But so sometimes it's using proxies rather than actual understanding of where the where the tax arrives. And obviously, if there's a company that has a single office and only operates in in Scotland, that's quite easy to understand where that is. It's more complex when you have the sort of the supermarkets, for example, uh, how do you allocate those? That there, we would look look for things like employment uh, to, to to allocate that. Again, that may not be a perfect uh, per perfect approach, but often because the way the tax collection system works, it doesn't allow you from the tax collection to identify where the ec economic activity arose. You have to use proxies to do some apportionment. So if we go back to Canada, because it says in the briefing here that in Canada, most of the statistics, they, you know, are, are gathered, I think it's top up rather than bottom, bottom up rather than top down. Um, it, in Canada, by collecting the statistics bottom up rather than top down, is that why they're able to produce more accurate figures at a provincial and a regional level? It's, it's not, I, I don't know enough of the details of how, uh, Canada works, but I know certainly, for example, they apportion their GST, um, their, their VAT system, and again, they have to use a whole series of, of the general uh, sales tax. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they have to use a whole series of proxies um, um, for, for 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 that. You can, in in theory, start asking businesses to apportion their activity between different uh, geographical areas, um, but that can be quite burdensome, and actually. Um, as a business yourself, how do you allocate overheads? It's always going to be a challenge yep. uh, how, how, how you do that. So even if you do start asking more granular data um, uh, of, of, of businesses, that may not be any more reliable than uh, using other data to apportion uh, apportion well, economic activity. And what's likely to be the margin of error, for example, in corporation tax estimates receipts? Uh, I, I wouldn't know off the top of my head, but I can give you a note as to explain those sources and um, 
but um, I, I cannot offer off the, off the top of my head now. Great, thank you. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Um, my question is specifically directed at the ONS. Um, so obviously we've got a situation where levels of devolution across the UK are you know, somewhat variable in terms of, of statistics and so on. Um, and the, the ONS obviously focuses um, particularly on developing statistics for um, both the UK as a whole, but also some regional statistics as well. So I'm wondering to what extent are the unique or you know, specific needs of the Scottish um, government or, or Scotland as a whole uh, sort of factored into the primary objectives of the ONS? Um, so going back to my opening remarks, our, our, we try and everything we do has to be user focused. What are people needing these statistics for and decisions that need, need to be made? And in that sense, uh, we are very, very alive to the needs of Scotland, but as I said, also Wales, Northern Ireland, and, and the English regions uh, with devolution within England. So that's a real f focus for us. I think we've got a track record of working with the Scottish Government to innovate, do things differently, to boost sample sizes in Scotland to provide more detail where that's, where, where that's needed. Um, so there is a real, I, I think from our, our point of view, there's a real willingness to work together. We have a regular um, uh, 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 meeting called the Inter-Administration Inter Committee where we sit down and we compare priorities, but that's not just economic statistics, that includes wider statistics, population, those, those sorts of things. We have a, 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 a particular uh, group that meets on economic statistics between uh, the ONS, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland on a quarterly basis as well to look at common issues, to look at what, what, what needs are. So I think there's a lot we do to try and make certain uh, we in, in incorporate all the different needs, whether that's a UK-wide need whether that's a, or whether that's a, a, a Scottish need. As I said, at times, some things that are, are easier to deliver than others and so you know some things do require extra resource or, or, or new uh, new data collections to do but we try as far as possible to meet all, all all user needs and I think I would hope we have a good reputation with the Scottish Government for for working constructively with them. Yes, my can I just, uh, sorry, sure. oh, can I just um, add, when we assess statistics produced by ONS, which are, um, of course, at the UK level, we assess them against the code of practice to determine whether they are uh, meeting the high standards to be a national statistic. Um, one of the things we look at is the extent to which they are serving user needs beyond the UK level. So we recently published an assessment of regional gross value added, and we looked a lot at the extent to which the questions which those statistics were addressing um, really spoke to the, 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 the interests of, of uh, policymakers in Scotland, but also in, in the regions of England and also Wales and Northern Ireland. So it is, it is a thing that we, in a sense, my job is to kind of sometimes prod or nudge uh, various degrees of politeness to firmness, the ONS into making change, and that's an area that we do, we do uh, make those interventions on. That, that was kind of what my next question was coming on to, the, the, the process for sort of developing those objectives. So you've obviously touched on that there with this um, inter-administration committee. And then, you know, um, Mr. Humphreyson has obviously said that there's a possibly an element of kind of encouraging the ONS to, to develop those processes. So can I just ask, if the Scottish Government, for instance, came to you in one of these committee meetings and said, look, we really want to go in a different direction, we want data on X, what would the, the kind of turnaround time frame be in, in terms of kind of developing that new sort of um, statistics? Um, I, I'm be slightly unhelpful here and say it would really depend on what, what, it, yeah. what it is. So as I said, um, inflation statistics have been a sort of long-standing issue where people have wanted to know, know more. We were lucky in the sense that we've now brought in a wider range of academics to work with us so we can now get them to think about how realistic that is, and what we would uh, what we would need to do. And I said, in some cases, we can respond very quickly because that you know, if the data is already sitting there and it just needs to be cut in a different way, that can often be done quite 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 straightforwardly. If it requires a whole new data collection, then we would I think we would just sit down with the Scottish government and work out what the best way of doing that is. Um, um, you know, that might be a, a combination. You know, Scotland uh, runs some of its own. Uh, um, could commission surveys itself. It could be something we do. It could be something we do 
where we take one of our existing surveys and modify it slightly in, in, in Scotland, all those options would be uh, would be open, and we would just think about what the best way of meeting those th those needs are. Sometimes there are very difficult conceptual issues, um, understanding exports or imports uh, to or from Scotland is 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 is, is, is conceptually challenging. Um, it's an area met, you know many. Um, uh, not not just not just in Scotland, but Wales is also very interested in that. But that that is quite challenging. So sometimes it's not just the data collection, but actually sometimes the conceptual issues of what does what does an export from Scotland uh, mean, for example. It can be quite challenging to to, to, to measure measure those things. So I think we would just be very open-minded uh, 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 about that, and and you know there are lots of different ways of answering those questions. Okay, thank you. Can I just inject a, a, a suggestion? Um, at the moment, key users like the Bank of England and the Treasury have an uh, annual process of interaction with the uh, ONS, uh, on which we basically uh, each year would say, you know, what worked well, what hadn't worked well, but also signals uh, priorities for future development, what we would like to see. And so when I was at the bank, we'd often be saying we'd like to see completion of the flow of funds, for instance. Um, I guess there is a question about to what extent the Scottish Government is consulted formally in, in its role as a user uh, of statistics and whether it might usefully be bought, brought into that process. It's simply a, a mechanism whereby on a regular basis uh, it could flag up uh, areas that it thought ought to be developed. Right, Andy Whiteman. Uh, thanks very much, convener. I mean, following on from that, um, section 20 of the Statistics and Registration Service Act provides that the board may itself produce and publish statistics relating to any matter relating to the United Kingdom or any part of it. So can we take it from that that the UK Statistics Authority has got unfettered powers to produce any statistics for any part of the UK on any matter? That's just what that says. There are obviously in, in certain areas, such as um, population, you know, uh, the collection and publication of population statistics rests with the National Register for Scotland. So in some cases, there are specific elements of devolution that have meant that, for example, it, the census, we are the census provider in England and Wales, NISRA is the provider in uh, in Northern Ireland and, and, uh, and NRS here, here in Scotland. So broadly, yes, but there are some areas where, you know, th there are long-standing constitutional differences that sure. means, um, but the, the means we, we don't get into those particular areas. Sure. And, and Section 23 says the board may not, without the consent of the Scottish ministers, produce and publish Scottish devolved statistics. Mm -hmm. um, I, I presume the board's never tried to publish devolved statistics, and the Scottish government said no. No, no, indeed. No. So that would okay. be, for example, so, population statistics I was just talking about. Yeah. So it seems that there's no statutory constraints to getting better statistics that are relevant to users, particularly in Scotland. And we heard, I think, last week from the Scottish Fiscal Commission, who perhaps have a... An, uh, a need which is of a different order of importance here because they're involved in forecasting mm. and on the basis of those forecasts we set budgets which affect the amount of tax people pay, the amount of uh, economic activity we anticipate be um, uh, generated uh, in the economy. So given that the current arrangements between the Statistics Authority and ONS and the Scottish Government are via protocols memorandum of understandings and joint meetings that, that take place on a regular basis. And as I understand, these uh, arrangements work pretty well. Um, is there a need to formalise that along the lines that um, um, Sir Charles Bean has just talked about to make sure that that becomes part of a much more formalised process whereby the needs of, for example, the Scottish Fiscal Commission mm -hmm can be flagged up pretty early in a process. Mm. And once it takes on its powers, everything's in place to allow it to do the job to the best of its abilities. Well, I, I think the, 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 there could well be. I mean, I think one of the things we have been thinking internally is, is um, the, the, through the UK Statistics Authority Board, uh, we are accountable to 
the, the Scottish Parliament, uh, the Welsh Assembly, Northern Ireland Assembly and the UK Parliament. And we have been thinking about how we um, make that real. Uh, we obviously lay our annual uh, uh, report and accounts, uh, sorry, an annual report before the, uh, before the Scottish, Scottish Parliament. But could we do something um, more systematic I think that would talk about what we had done to meet Scottish user needs and use that to elicit further uh, f feedback. So I'm very open-minded about how we might strengthen that, that, that relationship to make certain all needs are, are, are articulated early. We, we do go out and engage all users. We have something called Nacomic Statistics and Analysis Strategy, um, which sets out our priorities for the year. We go out and consult on that and say, is that is that people's needs? But certainly, there's, if there is more we could do, we think would be relevant to Scotland and particularly the Scottish Parliament. I think we'd be very open-minded uh, about that. There is something in what Sir Charles, Sir Charles has suggested here, and I think the Scottish Fiscal Commission is a really good um, exemplar of it. Here you have a, a, a body with some really important new uh, responsibilities um, that has identified a specific. Um, need uh, or a lack of completeness in the data it has available for a really fundamentally important uh, thing. They, they spoke about um, the time lag for their access to income and earnings uh, uh, data and, and thinking about whether there were more timely ways that they could um, get insights into income and earnings in Scotland. Of course, that resonated with me because uh, the Office for Statistics Regulation has um, for a couple of years now really been uh, prompting ONS on the question of more comprehensive income and earnings statistics and more timely ones. But I think the general point that here you have in the, the Commission, the Fiscal Commission, an important user with new responsibilities would be exactly the sort of player who could feed into some kind of forum to say, well, these are our needs. Um, what, what are the best ways to, to, to meet them? And I mean, on that point, on the practicalities of doing this, um, we have some figures about the, um, the money that the Scottish Government spends on boosting the various surveys to get better results. These are modest sums of, of, of money in the bigger scheme of things. But can I take it that those kind of arrangements are ad hoc arrangements? The government says it wants to boost a survey, talk to ONS. You say, well, this wouldn't be very easy. Budgets are tight this year. They say, well, we're happy to chip in something to help. And then you have a negotiation. Is that the kind of way it works? Or is there some formal protocol to what the Scottish Government will pay for and what it won't pay for, what it expects you to do? We, I mean, essentially, we would um, we would set a requirement, uh, you know, across uh, to, to to meet the particular uh, needs. So that might be a, a certain sample size. If if Scotland then wanted an additional sample size, we would expect that uh, on a cost recovery cost recovery basis, unless there was something very trivial. If it was a very simple thing to do, we wouldn't be uh, we wouldn't. Uh, ask for cost recovery, uh, cost recovery on that, but more generally, it's where it differs from the the, the UK approach. We would expect, uh, and yeah, that's how it has worked. That we ask for cost recovery uh, on on the, any additional costs from boosting those boosting those samples. Um, we think that, that seems to work well. Gives Scotland uh, the statistics it, it, it wants. Doesn't then mean we have to trade off anything else. Uh, within within the within the ONS, that then becomes a question for Scotland to think about whether actually um, that is worth the additional uh, the additional cost of of boosting those samples. Okay, thank you. And now Julian Martin. It, you've largely covered quite a lot of what I was going to ask around uh, inclusive growth and and regionality. So I'm going to ask you something else, and forgive me, I. I if it sounds like I'm expecting you to have watched every single second of an inquiry so far, <laughs> and, and tell me if I, if I am been off the mark there. So the, our inquiry has been going on for a number of weeks. Is there anything that you've heard from your evidence in preparing to come today that struck you as being something you didn't already appreciate or know that's maybe given you pause for thought on maybe how the existing, your existing bodies can actually better serve Scotland's interests. Maybe not with this, what we've just talked about with Andy Whiteman's question about us paying for more, but maybe just in terms of maybe just changing slightly how you operate when you're doing these existing surveys. I, sp I suppose the, the interesting thing, uh, I mean, I think um, picking up on the, the Scottish Fiscal Commission, I think that is 
something that is you know rapidly developing you know an, an interesting and challenging new function that needs to be done so i think there is something there that really that, that stood out for me and um, uh, as, a, as a particular issue. I think the other thing that, that was interesting here was this is a very, we are at a very um, interesting stage in the sense there are there are huge numbers of new requests coming through and I could sort of see lots of different lots of different elements that people were asking for. I, I was you know, surprised by the, the breadth of, of it and I think that simply um, as devolution widens and deepens, so I think that, so I think those needs will then become a, a bit more focused um, as uh, as new frameworks come in, you know, new measurement frameworks are developed, as uh, the Scottish government gets grips with new powers. I think those will then become a bit sharper focus. So I was, I was, I was, the, the breadth of 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 what you've heard. I think covers virtually everything in my responsibility in the ONS and a lot wider. It really was a real tour of all the issues that, 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 that pe on people's minds. Which of those become the most prominent in terms of um, really crunchy statistical needs? I think that's the next stage that I'm, I'm, I'm interested in seeing how we sort of narrow down that very, very wide field into some priorities that really, you know, we can then start to work through. From my point of view, and I'm not sure if this is going to answer your question, uh, but I'll say what my reaction was to, to, to looking at the, the previous sessions. There's one thing which slightly surprised me and one thing uh, which quite excited me. The thing which surprised me was I think you had a couple of witnesses who, who talked about the need for a, a sort of stronger ecosystem of, of, of research and um, analysis outside government. Uh, in, in Scotland, and that rather surprised me because from my perspective, I see really quite a strong range of, of, of organizations, both in academia, um, uh, there are some good think tanks. I think Fraser of Allender is, is an absolutely superb <coughs> institute which does great work. So I was quite surprised that some of your witnesses, um, I wasn't quite sure what their benchmark was. I think there's a, there's a really good basis. The thing which excited me um, kind of builds on that, and, and that is that uh, you had a few witnesses who were talking about not so much the statistics and data produced by government, but the statistics and data produced by a whole range of other actors, um, um, enterprise bodies, uh, um, research bodies, and, and, and so on. And thinking, well, is there some way of, of, of sort of linking those up into a sort of a, a consistent uh, framework? Because of course, then it'd be more usable. I think that's really exciting, and it, and it really maps on very well to something that we're quite keen to advocate, which is that the code of practice that we have for official statistics um, could be um, adopted much more widely um, and be adopted by providers of information and statistics who aren't necessarily government bodies. Now, there are some things in that code which are specifically uh, designed for the government uh, context, things like the pre-release access or the publication time at 9.30. But if you step back from those and say, well, why does publication at 9.30 matter? Well, it matters because uh, the producer of the information, the, the official body, the, the government, um, wants to demonstrate a commitment to its users that it will publish at a particular time, come what may, uh, and regardless of, 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 of political uh, drivers. Um, that sort of commitment to being trustworthy is... Uh, can be satisfied in a number of ways, but the principle of trustworthiness is something that uh, a whole range of, of, of other bodies could easily adopt and describe how they comply with. And similarly with the things that we talk about around the quality of, of statistics, how that's explained, um, how you make quality transparent to users, uh, and indeed about the value of statistics, how uh, statistics um, produced by a, uh, any organisation answer key questions. We think those kind of high level, we call them pillars, those high level pillars trustworthiness, quality, value, are not kind of the unique preserve of government. And I think it's quite an exciting debate that you've had with the wider actors in your ecosystem to think about are there ways of, of adopting kind of universal principles that can just help users marry up different sources in a confident way. I think that's really kind of um, very innovative and uh, I'd, I'd be very happy to talk about it more actually. I think it's an exciting development. Thank you. Thank you. that poses this question, but... Well, I... it's a, a follow-up from yourself, I think. 
<laughs> it's on the pre-release access to statistics, something the convener has raised, I believe, with the First Minister previously. Um, you've changed your approach to ministers getting access to statistics in advance. Um, it, but the Scottish Government, unfortunately, seems to be stuck um, doing something entirely different. Um, would you advise them to change in the same way as you've done? Yes. yes. <laughs> okay, okay. Always like uh, and, 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 I, and I say that as somebody who's been on the other side of the fence as a mm. obviously a key user when I was on the monetary policy okay. uh, committee. But I mean, at the end of the day, uh, having um, uh, very tight rules around pre-release uh, access uh, prevents abuse uh, and sometimes um, you know these are accidents rather than deliberate somebody knows something in advance and they say something which reveals market sensitive information which shouldn't have been out there uh, but it brings the process uh, into to disrepute uh, and of course sometimes people may deliberately exploit pre-release access for for personal gain and we think there have been uh, examples of that uh, in the past as well. Uh, so I think at the end of the day, although um, it, uh, I mean, ministers obviously like having early access because they can be briefed about what the numbers mean and all of this. And it does mean that um, their initial reaction is informed rather than uh, ill-informed. So you can see the, the argument for it. But at the end of the day, I think the balance of arguments uh, support uh, pretty strict um, limitations on pre-release access. So, so my first answer to your question is yes. Um, a more um, sort of structured answer is actually the act um, under which uh, we operate as the Office for Statistics Regulation um, prevents us from imposing any changes to pre-release access arrangements. The Act specifically says that our code of practice, you know, this, this core enforcement tool, uh, cannot deal with the granting of pre-release access. So it's the choice of the producer of the statistics, whether they grant pre-release access. The ONS has recently chosen to, to, to remove it, and actually shortly afterwards the Bank of England uh, itself um, followed that. Um, the Scottish Government has chosen another way. Um, so I can't sort of say my yes and then kind of enforce it. The Act, Act prevents me to, from doing so. But I can make some kind of advocacy comments. And the things that I'd, uh, I'd advocate in this space are, are twofold. Firstly, why do we care so much about this? It's because at the heart of what statistics are about is they are a public asset. They are there for the public uh, consumption of information to understand the nature of the world, the nature of policy, the nature of the decisions being made. Um, and that vision of a public asset um, is underpinned by statistics being equally available to all and not sort of partially available to some audiences and not others, um, and by them uh, being available as soon as they're ready. Pre-release access seems to run against those two principles. Uh, moreover, I just think it makes the job of the Scottish Government as a producer of statistics a little bit harder. I mean, they will, I no doubt, have an argument that it makes, makes it it's beneficial because it allows them to have access to ministers and, and to explain the content of the statistics. But I think you've got to set against that, this perception issue, whether or not, uh, as, as, as Charles has identified, there are actual breaches. There's the, there's the, there's the perception that one set of actors, ministers, are getting a privileged access that others aren't. And I think that means the Scottish Government, to establish its trustworthiness, to use my, my term again, to establish its trustworthiness, needs to work that much harder to demonstrate um, the, the, the integrity of its production process. I think it makes their work harder. In saying that, I'm not making any uh, judgments or accusations um, about the people and, and what they do. They are highly professional. I mean, genuinely, they are highly professional statisticians who, who do an excellent job. I just think this, this, this makes their, their work harder. Just to follow up from that then, do you think the Scottish Government should be both a producer and user of statistics? Or is it the case that it's, um, the setup is fine, but it's just the pre-release issue that you might have a difficulty with. So I, I, I'll, I'll um, give my first thoughts on that. Um, I think that um, good statistics can emerge from a whole range of institutional arrangements. If you look across the UK, 
you have um, in Northern Ireland, you have this model of a, a separate agency, NISRA, that is um, an agency of the Department of Finance, um, which operates kind of hub and spoke model. There's a central NISRA with about 200 uh, people, but then a lot of its statisticians are embedded into the various departments in the Northern Ireland administration. Um, that's a very powerful model for ensuring that those individual departments, whilst they are producing their own statistics, have a, uh, a, a powerful professional um, voice. Um, in England, uh, you have uh, ministerially-led departments who are very um, effective producers of statistics um, in a very um, high-quality way. I mean, if I could just single out one um, example, um, the work that DWP do, Department for Work and Pensions, do to produce households below average income, that's an absolutely uh, superb statistical output which emerges from a... Um, uh, a, a ministerially-led department. Um, in Scotland, you have what you might call a, a sort of a, a three peaks model. You have a strong uh, statistical hub in the Scottish government. You have National Records Scotland, uh, and you have ISD Scotland, who produce the NHS statistics. Um, I don't think that I have any presumption that one of those models is superior to the other. I think what really matters is um, very, very uh, clear adherence to the code of practice, the code of practice which enables statisticians to operate independently across all of those institutional settings, um, and um, clear um, uh, development of, of, of professional standards, a focus on quality. So I think I'm agnostic on this question of um, where the production takes place, if, if I can put it like that. Um, but I, as I to go back to my earlier point, I think it, it creates a little bit more of an uphill struggle in perception terms, um, this, this pre-release access point. Yeah, I, I, I think it certainly does go beyond pre-release access, because certainly if you have uh, production taking place within a, a department that's using it, uh, potentially tensions will rise. So you have to have very clear uh, uh, sort of protocols and it, uh, it be clear that the producers of the statistics in the department uh, are independent and producing those statistics without interference. I mean, the whole structure of uh, statistics, the ONS, UPSA and so forth, going back to 2007, uh, has its roots in the perception uh, I think it was crime statistics, if I remember right. But anyway, certainly that some statistics uh, and unemployment as well were basically being uh, massaged or uh, fiddled by the uh, uh, ministers in, in charge of the departments. Um, that may not have been true, but nevertheless there was a perception of that. So the key objective in the 2007 Act was really to set up clarity of independence and production. Uh, and that really needs uh, very clear uh, uh, rules of operation inside the, uh, the department or organization uh, involved. And one of the things that uh, obviously I investigated in the course of my review was whether that process was working. It was largely, but it was clear that there were occasions uh, that some producers were being put under inappropriate pressure uh, by their minister or uh, the senior civil servants. Um, and you, you have to have a sort of robust uh, framework there. It's possible to do it, but uh, it needs to be clear. What happens to the senior civil servant abuses it like Sir Nicholas Henderson did during the referendum? I, I mean, I think if... Uh, Nothing happened to him. Uh, I mean, if, if there's an, an abuse that presses, is it it's up to... Yeah. Uh, well, why why, wasn't, and, why um, wasn't he done under the code? Well, you'll have to ask uh, uh, John Plunge. I don't know whether so, Jonathan wants to... Sorry, I'm not sure that that's uh, within your remit to decide who should be done under the code or not. <laughs> so, well, um, it is under Mr Humpherson's. Really? Well, we'll let Mr. Humpherson answer if he chooses to on that one. I'm not going to comment on that particular case because it was some time ago. The, the thing I would say is that we uh, we repeatedly, um, um, both in, um, in, in Scotland and in other parts of the UK, will make public statements about the way statistics not only are produced 
by the statisticians, but are disseminated and used by government departments. And uh, we have a, a whole uh, long stream of correspondence where we've um, made some quite firm public statements, um, which are really reminding um, all who uh, are involved with the production of government information, not simply the statisticians, that they have responsibilities to the public. And we will continue to do that. Thank you. And a question from Jamie Halko Johnson. Um, yes, uh, thank you very much, Kavina. Um, as Ireland's an <coughs> Ireland's MSP, uh, you know, obviously I represent an area which is huge and diverse, and um, e even within it, there's differences within the kind of um, economic speed of the local economies. So I wanted to ask um, whether administrative could play a, a role or an increasing role in providing more useful localised data within within the regions of Scotland and even more local than that, and also um, whether that data could be usable for um, getting an idea of regional produ productivity? Um, in, in short, the answer is yes. Um, we, uh, uh, so, so certainly more, uh, more administrative data. So uh, one of our, one of our uh, areas we want to explore next is PAYE data. So we would then be able to understand much more in a much more granular way, what what people what people's earnings uh, from employment are, em, employment are in a particular area, we could go down quite small on that one. We'd have to be very careful. We don't you know, it doesn't become disclosive, mm -hmm. um, but we we would certainly want 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 to do that. And as I said, VAT data does allow you to go down to to, to, to final levels. There are some challenges uh, uh, around that, and as I um, uh, in, 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 in a previous role, I think I answered. Uh, uh, I think it was an MP in Westminster who asked what was the, how much VAT was paid by a particular postcode, which I believed was a Scottish island. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, that, <laughs> the, the, there was only one company trading there, and then had a VAT repayment. Yeah. So it looked like this island was not paying uh, VAT. But as I said, that's the function of how it's collected. Um, and then you need to understand, given what we what data we have, how much can we really infer as to what's going on locally? So it's back to it's not a magic bullet, but it does allow you to have a lot more granular data. We would never be able to have uh, surveys with that level of, of detail. So VAT data, we have 30 or 40 times as much data as we collect through our business surveys. Um, it is is really. Uh, astounding the level of detail we have but as I said there are difficulties in how you interpret that data but that would give you um, a much greater understanding of, of lo local performance so as I said when we publish our, 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 our balanced gross value added we're looking at not just doing Scotland but the next layer down in terms of detail now obviously for the Highlands and Islands that's a uh, you know that that, that that, that you know the numbers of people involved are, are quite small to, to g give you much granularity or to give you much resolution, but in theory we can exp then extend that further down using ad ad administrative data sources. Okay. Thank, you. thank you, and uh, Dean Lockhart. Uh, thank you, convener. One of the central policies of the Scottish government, the 4I economic policy, is inclusive growth, and one of the questions we've asked in other, other sessions is whether there is a recognised economic definition or statistical measurement of inclusive growth, or does it fall into the category of what you mentioned before about well-being, an amalgamation of different uh, measurements which may mean different things to different people? I think it does fall into that category of having a, a, a scorecard. I mean, it's many... Uh you know, one of the criticisms of, of GDP is as an average measure, and it's the distribution that uh, is important in, in, in people's well-being. So we do try and provide more detail on uh, the distribution of, uh, of income, on the distribution of wealth. Those are quite difficult things uh, to measure because you need to really get a good understanding of, 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 of households and, and a high degree of detail. Um, so... To my, to my mind, yes, there are some definitions, some shortcuts we use, um, but you have to be very careful. Sometimes those those shortcuts, so sometimes we use uh, in, in households below average income, and there are met poverty or low income is measured by certain percents of household, uh, the household median. Um, but some people will say they're arbitrary, so you have to be very careful that you don't just choose one number that you have to look across the whole suite of them. Similarly, for measures of inequality, there is uh, the, the main measure of inequality is something called the Gini coefficient, but actually that's only measuring 
one aspect of inequality. There are lots of other different aspects of inequality that might be salient. Um, and also, it's inequality in what? Um, we often focus on inequality in income, but in inequality in wealth um, might be more relevant. Um, and also, then, it's also how social mobility. So there are just many aspects to understanding these, these issues, which I think, both from a technical point of view, of not choosing one particular measure that could sometimes go, go you know, have perverse results, through to recognising that inclusiveness, understanding social welfare is actually a multifaceted thing in itself. I, I think the, the real key here is uh, define your question carefully at the beginning. So don't start with the statistic and then say, oh, well, now what question can we throw at it? Think about what the question is that you're... Uh, you want to answer and try and define that precisely and then go and look for the statistic that most closely corresponds to that or set of statistics because I think Jonathan is right this is this is territory where probably you're looking at a portfolio of indicators thank you all right well thank you very much to our witnesses thank you for coming in today I'll now suspend the public session and move into private session. Thank you.